Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Ummah Radio. You are listening to the Mustalah al Hadith class with myself, Abu Musab. Alright, so we are doing the kitab known as Muqaddimatun fi Usul al Hadith of Mulana Abdul Haq al Dihlawi rahimahullah. And last time we had just touched on the topic of what is a hadith and the various types that a hadith is broken down into. We then touched on the topic of the word like such as khabar and athar. And we then learned about a hadith consisting of three types, which is the mawquf, marfu' and maqtu' those three types. Then we went on to how a hadith becomes marfu' meaning how it becomes attributed directly to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There were two ways in how it is done, either explicit or implicit. And in our last class, we completed the explicit ones, which was verbally explicit, explicit action, or a, an explicit uh, affirmation of an action. So that was on page 37 of the book. So tonight, inshallah, we start from page 38 or page 40 if you are following from a PDF reader. And the, the, for those who don't have the book, you can download it from Ummah Forum, www.ummah.com slash forum. You'll see a link in the Ummah Radio section for the download to download the Kitab Rather. Alright, so to continue on, tonight inshallah we move on now to the implicit ways as to how a hadith becomes marfu'. So to continue, Bismillahi walhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. He says, Al-Qawliyu al-Hukmi, the implicit marfu' hadith which is made implicit through a statement. He says, وَأَمَّا حُكْمًا فَكَإِخْبَارِ الصَّحَابِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ أَلَّذِي لَمْ يُخْبِرْ عَنِ الْكُتُبِ الْمُتَقَدِّمَةِ مَا لَا مَجَالَ لِلْإِجْتِهَادِ فِيهِ عَنِ الْأَحْوَالِ الْمَاضِيَةِ كَأَخْبَارِ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ أَوْ الْآتِيَةِ كَالْمَلَاحِمْ وَالْفِتَنِ وَأَهْوَالِ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ He says that for a hadith that it, it, we know it to be marfu' despite the fact that there is it is not attributed directly to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa with any explicit wording, but rather it is with implicit wording. He says, for a, an example, it's like when a sahabi, radiyallahu anhu, he gives some information, alladhi lam yukhbir anil kutub al meaning a sahabi who, who is speaking not from something which comes from the previous books. Now here, on this point here, if you look at, footnote number one he goes on and he says أي التورات والأناجيل والقصص والروايات الإسرائيلية التي كان يحكيها بعض الصحابة ويرونها عن بعض التابعين ممن قرأوا كتب اليهود والنصارى he says the books the كتب المتقدمة which the books of the previous books which are being referred to are like the Torah and the Injil and the stories and the Israel the Israeliya, those Israeli narrations, which some of the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum had reported, and some of the Tabi'in as well, like Ka'b al Ahbar, who was a Jew who converted to Islam, he was a Tabi'i, he's very famous for all these sort of narrations here. So, if it's not from these things, now amongst the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, who would quote a lot from the Israeliya, is for example, Hadrat Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhum, he quotes a, quite a number of these. Israeliyat narrations which speaks of things which had passed by and, and things all of the unseen so when it comes to matters like that we know it's from the Israeliyat so that's not what is being referred to he says here he gives such information which is which does not come from, come from any of the previous books so it's not from the Torah it's not from the Injil it's not from any of those narrations which come from the Jews and the Christians and he says, مَا لَا مَجَالَ لِلْإِجْتِهَادِ فِيهِ And there is no way that a person can make ijtihad. You know, how can you make ijtihad and say that, for example, like today people say that the, it was an atom and the atoms, two atoms were flying and then they crashed into one another and it was a big bang and things like this. This is speaking, as you can say, just pulling something out of your head. There's nothing be, uh, knowledgeable behind it. So if a Sahabi, for example, were to mention something like this, because nobody knows how the world was created. So if a Sahabi had mentioned that two atoms had hit against one another and caused a big bang, then this would have been termed a qawli hukmi marfu hadith. Why? Because no Sahabi spoke from his own personal opinion on matters of the unseen. 
And if he had to mention something from the unseen like this, despite the fact that he does not say that this is from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but the mere fact that it is a sahabi who is making the statement is sufficient for us to know that he heard this indeed from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that is why he is mentioning it. If it was just from his own side, he would never mention anything like this. And this is something which applies to all of the sahaba radiallahu anhum. They never just spoke nonsense just from their own side. If they said something which did, which is not known from the Quran and from the Sunnah in explicit words like that, then it was because it's something that was taught to them or told to them by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in any case, coming back here, he says that this implicit wording is for when a Sahabi who was not informed of something from the previous books. And it's not something that you can make your own investigation and ijtihad on that matter. Like for example, عن الأحوال الماضية Things which happened in the in the past. He says, yeah, كأخبار الأنبياء Like the story of the Anbiya. Or he says, أو الآتية كالملاحم والفتن وأهوال يوم القيامة Either matters of the past or matters of the future. Things which are still to come. كالملاحم Like the battles like what the, when the Mahdi and Isa alayhi salam and all these sort of things, all the malahim, the great battles to take place, while fitan and all the different trials and tribulations which will afflict the ummah in this world. Like if a sahabi says that this will take place and this fitna will ha- happen and things like this, this is, he, obviously no sahabi had knowledge of the unseen. So therefore when he speaks on matters which are yet to take place, then this is also an indication that it is a qawli hukmi marfu' hadith, meaning that he learned this and gained it from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also he says, وَأَهْوَالِ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ And the terrors of the day of Qiyamah. No, like again, nobody knows the unseen. So if a Sahabi says, this is how Jahannam is, or this is how Jannah is, or this is how a person will suffer on the day of Qiyamah, and there's no explicit hadith that we know on, of on that matter, then the mere fact that a Sahabi is narrating it, it's sufficient to tell us that he heard this from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He then continues, he says, أو عن ترتب ثواب مخصوص أو عقاب مخصوص على فعل أو أو for example he says that the sahabi he starts speaking on specific rewards and specific punishments for a particular action and this is actually something which people has taken totally out of context in today's times and they started doing it left right and center but you can look just from this point here that you don't have the uh, right to add your own rewards and punishments to matters. Now today a person will bring up his own thing which may be good in the sharia, something of the sort like that but then he come and he adds his own rewards. If you read this poem or this durood x amount of times then this and this and this and this and this is what will happen and you will have three houses in Jannah and four palm trees and things like this. When there is no mention of this from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and obviously we did not get it from the Sahaba radiallahu anhum but rather it's some shaykh who came out with these sort of things here. So this is something which is not acceptable because as you can see here if a sahabi mentioned it then the mere fact that he mentioned it is because he did not speak from his own nafs but rather because it was something which he heard from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so when a sahabi would mention a reward for a particular action or a punishment for a particular action then obviously this is something which he gained also from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فَإِنَّهُ لَا سَبِيلَ إِلَيْهِ إِلَّا سِمَاعَ عَنِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. Because there is no way for the Sahabi to speak on any of these sort of matters except by hearing it from Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم. So basically that is how a قولي حكمي مرفوع hadith works. That a Sahabi speaks on something which is matters of the unseen which did not come from any of the previous books. To put it in a, in a nutshell, you can put it in that manner. He then moves on now to the next one. He says, al fi'ali yul hukmi The implicit hadith, which uh, implicitly marfu' hadith, which comes out through an action. So he says, أو يفعل الصحابي ما لا مجال للإجتهاد فيه Or a sahabi does an action which there is no means of ijtihad in this particular matter. We can take something which is rather quite simple. And that is, for example, the method of salah. 
quite simple and straightforward. So if you, that is why you find, if the like for example, according to the Hanafi madhab, it's sufficient for us to say that Hadrat Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu did not do raf'ul yadain. He did not have to still mention and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did not do raf'ul yadain every time, although there are narrations to that effect, but he did not need to mention it. Why? Because he learned the method of salah from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So although there is no words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nor is a sahabi even speaking, but the mere fact that he is performing salah in this manner is a... It's not something that he can bring from his own ijtihad that he decide to perform salah this way. When salah is something which was perfected, sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli, perform salah the way you have seen me perform salah. So it's not something that a sahabi could now come and make his own ijtihad on and decide, okay, no, I'll do it in this particular manner here. Yeah, it's just my feeling to do things like this. That was not how the sahaba radiyallahu anhum were. So therefore, if they did something, it was something which they got from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So like this example, like I mentioned, the fact that Hadrat Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu did not raise his hands every time for every posture in salah, that itself is a proof that it was something which ca- it makes it a fi'li hukmi marfu' hadith to say that this action of his is actually an action that was done by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So those are the two types of far, the qawli and the fi'li hukmi narration, marfu' hadith. Now the third type, he says, at-taqririyu al-hukmi. Now you have the implicit affirmation. He says, aw yukhbiru al-sahabi bi annahum kanu yaf'aluna kadha fi zaman al-nabiyyi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam li anna al-zahira ittila'uhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala thalik wa nuzul al-wahi bihi. He says that a Implicit affirmation is if a Sahaba, one Sahabi, he mentions that the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, they used to do kaza wa kaza, they would do such and such an action during the time of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The mere fact he's just saying we used to do it or someone used to do it or someone did it during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is an implicit affirmation to say that the action is proven from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Here he's speaking, if you remember the previous, what's the difference between this taqreer and the taqreer which had come by previously with regards to a hadith? The difference is, with that taqreer, the term which was used is that a taqreer, an affirmation of an action done in the physical presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. While this year is an action which was done during the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, though not in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So slight difference, one is in the presence and one is not in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but both were done during the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if a Sahabi mentions that the Sahaba used to do this during the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then that is a an implicit affirmation that it is permissible and it is something which was accepted by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he said al-zahira ittula'uhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala thalik the apparent what is quite apparent to us is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have known about this action and wa nuzulul wahi bihi and the fact that Revelation used to come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was being informed through wahi about the actions of the sahaba radiyallahu anhum, obviously the action of the sahabi would have been included as well. So if there was anything wrong, then he, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have informed him that for X, Y, Z, this is the reason here, this was wrong or this was right and things of that matter. But the fact that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't say anything is proof of its permissibility and proof rather that it is also a taqreer, an affirmation of something proven through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alright, now the last part he says, أو يقولون من السنة كذا Alternative method of how a hadith becomes a implicit affirmation is if one of the sahaba they say for example, such and such an action is from the sunnah. Just, just using those terms, using from the sunnah. They don't ex- impl- uh, explain which sunnah, whose sunnah, anything. They just use the term from the sunnah. He says, لِأَنَّ ظَاهِرَ أَنَّ سُنَّةَ سُنَّةَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ 
because the, what is quite apparent is that when the term sunnah is used it refers to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وقال بعضهم إنه يحتمل سنة الصحابة وسنة الخلفاء الراشدين فإن سنة تطلق عليه He says but other ulama they have a different opinion they say that it's possible that when a sahabi uses the term sunnah it can also refer to the sunnah of the sahaba or the sunnah of the khulafa or rashidin the hadrat abu bakr hadrat umar hadrat uthman and hadrat ali radiyallahu anhum it could also refer to their sunnah like rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi wa sallam said alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al khulafa ar rashidin al mahdiyin addu alayha bin nawajid in that hadith that if I hold firm to my sunnah and the sunnah of my khulafai rashidin. So the word sunnah was used as well. So he says, according to some ulama, they say that the word sunnah, if a sahabi says, mina sunnati kada, that such an action is from the sunnah, it's possible he could be meaning it's from the sunnah of the sahaba radiyallahu anhum, the sunnah of the khulafai rashidin, uh, because the word sunnah is used unrestrictedly for all of this as well. Although it's possible as at the same time that it could also be from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So here you find a bit of a slight difference of opinion. The first part of the implicit affirmation is if a sahabi said that this was done during the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, everyone's agreed on that point. The point of disagreement is when the term mina sunnati kada, when this particular term of this being an action being from the sunnah this is the only point where they differ whether this the mere fact that a sahabi is saying this is from the sunnah do they mean that it is from the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or do they mean that it could possibly also be from the sunnah of the sahaba radiyallahu anhum okay so that is the end of the implicit affirmation and it is the end of page 39 and also it is the end of chapter number one so instead of moving onwards to chapter number two this will enter into a new field altogether now into the si- the chapter with regards to the sanad and the matan the chain and the te- actual text of the hadith so instead of entering into that point which we'll have to stop then in a few minutes and go a, a halfway lesson. So rather, we will stop at this point here, inshallah. And if there's any questions with regards to the lesson, you can ask your questions now. And we'll also do a quick recap with regards to what we have passed by so far. Okay, first question is, what is ijtihad? Ijtihad... Literally, when the term ijtihad is normally used, what is meant is, or rather in general sense, is the the badlul wasi'i wa juhd is when an alim spends his, uses his utmost to try and derive a ruling. So this is what ijtihad is generally used as in this particular term. But here, in this particular chapter with which we were doing ijtihad, okay, it comes from that same meaning, but it means from a person's... It's not something that you can... Do on your own. It's not something that is man-made. Let me put it in that way. It's something which... It's part of the deen. So it must find its roots in the deen. It's not something that you can just make up your own part of the deen. That is what the... What ijtihad... What that particular ijtihad part here is referring to. But I'll come to that in a moment, inshallah. The next question was... Is it specific acts of worship or any action a Sahabi does was... What, does, does it mean it was also done by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Okay. With regards to specific acts, it's not restricted only to salah. What the, the purpose of the point is, I brought that just as an example. But what he means is here, ma la majala lil ijtihadi fihi. That a, there is no way that it comes from a particular person. The easiest example to give was that of salah. But it applies to anything which is an action which... Okay, let's say a sahabi killed a particular person. Let's take for example now... Hadat Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiyallahu anhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had sent him as a judge to Yemen. And I think Hadat uh, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiyallahu anhu as well. And the two of them met up. And there was a man who was in chains. So the one Sahabi who was on the horse, he uh, he asked that what's with this man over here? Why is he in chains? Then the Sahabi, the other Sahabi said it's because he had 
he is a murtad he accepted he was if a Jew he accepted Islam then he became a murtad so the Sahabi said if you don't kill him I won't get off from the camel meaning I'll leave straight away from here I won't visit you whatsoever so when he after he killed him then only he dismounted and so then the narration continues so this year is something why kill the person is because it is something which was a command of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're not quite a correct uh, example to use because there is actually an explicit hadith on this point of man badala deenahu faqtuluhu that whomsoever changes his religion from Islam then kill him. That's the, an explicit hadith on that particular point. So it's not quite the same a, a thing to use as, as an example. But just for example, I'm meaning here now on the point of killing somebody which is normally, as you would say, something which is impermissible. But here you can see that he is killed for this reason because of this particular point here, it's meaning it was something which was learned by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like I said, it's not quite a correct example to use, but it's it's interlinked in a way. So that was with regards to that point. So just to run a quick recap, Okay, we've got another question over here. What is the master of the word ijtihad? The master of the word ijtihad, ijtihad is actually on the bab ifti'al. That's how it becomes ijtihad. It's juhud, jim, ha, dal. These are the three root letters of the word. So, jah, jahada, yajhadu, jahadan, fahuwa jahidun. That's the, the bab, as you would say, as it goes on. So, Jahdun, that is the root word of the word ijtihad. And each jahadun, if you look at it, jahada, it means to strive, to struggle, to spend one's utmost. And obviously when it comes into an Islamic perspective, into the shari'i meaning of the word jihad again, then we know it means to fight against the kuffar and so on and so forth. So in any case, that's the root word of the word jahada. All right. That's that. So just to run a quick recap, just to repeat again, basically what we learned in chapter number one. So chapter number one, it dealt with the definition of the word hadith and the types of hadith that you get. So the types of hadith was broken down into three, which was a qawl, a fi'al, and a taqreer. A statement, an action, and an affirmation. That's how we first started out this chapter. And that in turn, the had term hadith again then, it broke down into a, f- a further three terms, which was marfu' meaning a raised narration, which is attributed directly to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The second one was al-mawquf, which is a stopped narration, which stops at a sahabi and does, is not attributed directly to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the last one was al-maqtu' which was a cut-off narration, which stops at a tabi'i and does not even reach a sahabi. So then we moved on to a different point, which was the term hadith and athar and of course khabar as well. So despite the differences of opinion amongst the ulama, some who hold the opinion that khabar is rather best used for this and athar is best used for that and hadith for this and all of that sort of things as we passed by the most correct view is that the three terms are synonyms so if you want to call a hadith an athar or you want to call it a khabar or you want to call it a hadith then in all three cases it will be permissible so hadith, athar, khabar you can use it as synonyms of one another that was that point. Then we moved on to how a hadith, how marfu' takes place. That meaning how you attribute a hadith directly to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. There was two ways, explicit and implicit. Explicit was again broken down into f- three categories. Explicitly in wording, explicitly through an action or an explicit affirmation. And then the, what we did tonight now was the implicit versions, an implicit action, an implicit affirmation, and an implicit statement. So that is, together is the explicit and the implicit, and that's the sum total of how a hadith becomes marfu', meaning how it becomes attributed directly to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.
Okay, we've got another question over here. Okay, the question asks, so all this we are talking about is still sahih though so far? No, not exactly. We are now just dealing with what is a hadith. We have not come into definitions of hadith. Because a hadith which is منق... uh, which which is موقوف and منقطع is a منقطع صحيح is it hasan is it ضعيف and things like this this will come down now from the next chapter a hadith is linked okay there's one point which actually comes now into the next chapter one is marfu meaning it is attributed the more correct term would be it is attributed to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam it must not be mixed up with the term muttasil which means joined and linked to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one is an attribu- attribution and the other one is a, a linkage. So a muttasil is a chain which has no one missing in. It's connected straight through to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And obviously if there's someone missing from the chain then we know there's a breakage somewhere and then there's a problem. While a marfu on the other hand is that someone is explicitly saying that this hadith is from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, what's the difference between the two? The questioner asks, is the difference is a hadith which is muttasil. This one is authentic, all authentic hadith has to be muttasil. It means it has to be joined with an unbroken chain to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If there's any bro- breakage in the chain, obviously then it, its authenticity level will drop. But the Marfu perspective is that it does not deal with the authenticity so much because Marfu is basically just saying that this does come or rather this was something Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said because anybody can come and say for example Hadrat Ali radiyallahu anhu said Hadrat Umar radiyallahu anhu said let's say uh, an, uh, Nafi' the freed slave of Hadrat Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu he would then let's say for example he say he reports and he say that Hadrat Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu said, but now it's his statement. So this is a marfu narration of Hadrat Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu. It is not a hadith. It is not something which is attributed to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So it's two. They may sound the same, but they're rather different. In, in that a mar, a marfu is just simply saying this is who it is being attributed to. While a muttasil is something entirely different, and this is what affects the authenticity of a narration. A marfu' hadith is not always attributed to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or is it? A marfu' hadith is always attributed to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. After all, that is the point why it is being termed marfu'. Marfu' in the term we see, you see, we're not doing dealing here with. Arabic just because if we were talking Arabic then a, a statement attributed to me to the next man we could use the term marfu left right and center but here we are using istilahul muhaddithin the terminologies of the muhaddithin so in the terminologies of hadith and the ulama of hadith when the term marfu is used it's referred and it is used for a hadith which is being which is attributed to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So any statement or any action or any affirmation which is said to have the approval or come from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then this is why the term marfu is used. Obviously, if you say it is mawqoof, then it stops somewhere along the line and and it has not reached Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a in, in an unbroken ma- uh, manner. A Sahabi is saying it, but he's not saying that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said it, despite the fact that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa may have said it, or may, perhaps did say it, but he is not linking it all the way up to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, question says, so is a marfu' hadith like when a sahabi reported a narration in the absence yet in the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Whether it was during the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whether it was after the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, any time when it was attributed and said that I'm telling you, 
That's the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then the mere fact that it is being said that this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that is what makes it marfu'. The fact that the source where it is going to is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If a sahabi spoke and he said, I'm telling you what Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu said, then, uh, for example, if I, I'm telling you what Hazrat Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu said, that would not be termed marfu' in the terminology of the muhaddithin because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not anywhere in this narration it's not being said that this is the words of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam but rather it's being said that this was the words of hadrat abu bakr, abu bakr radiyallahu anhu so a marfu' hadith is basically just a hadith which or rather any narration which is being said that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it that it, it's not a difficult thing to understand you must just realize and understand that many people can say and do and whatever it is and it's uh, many people do say and do all sort of things but i do something for myself and i'm the person who did it and the next person he do something for himself and he attribute it to whoever and what all and what not but when something is being said that this is what rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said or rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did or rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam agreed with this then this is where this term of marfu' comes in to say that this action or the statement or this affirmation is being it's being said to be something which came from Rasulullah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Okay, next question is A mawquf hadith is one that is attributed to a sahabi only and a maqtu' hadith is one that is attributed to a tabi'i That's, uh, That is correct What is meant is that the the statement is actually f- supposed to be from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but it stops at a sahabi. You will find, and this comes actually sometimes explicit in narrations where a sahabi would mention something. Let's say I speak something, and I say that let let's say I'm now a sahabi, just for example, and I'm speaking, and I say, and I say, cursed the people, the tattooers, for example. I'm saying it as though it is my words. This would be termed as mawquf. You would find it like that. And some of the sahaba, they would speak like this and say, and if I wanted to, I could make it marfu'. This is a term which is actually used in the hadith, that the sahabi would narrate something and speak something from himself and then say, if I wanted to, I could say it is marfu', meaning that this, I could say that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said this because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did indeed teach that to the particular sahabi. So, when the term mawquf is being used, it means that it's something which was a narration which stopped at a sahabi. The sahabi did not say, I heard this from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And likewise with a maqtu' when a tabi'i, he stops it, it stops by him. He does not say, I heard it from Hazrat Anas ibn Malik, or I heard it from Hazrat Abu Bakr, or I heard it from Hazrat Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiyallahu anhum, for example. So it stops, depending on where it stops, it's either mawquf, or maqtu' and obviously if it goes right up to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say that it it basically it finds its home at, by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then only is it marfu' obviously if it finds its home by a sahabi and does not go higher then it will only reach the level of mawquf and finally if it stops at a tabi'i it will only reach the level of maqtu' All right then, so that was, we had a quick run through through the through chapter number one. And next week, inshallah, we will continue on from chapter number two, Al-Fasl al-Thani. So that will be on page 42 if you're following from the PDF. And page 40 if you are follow, uh, 42 if you're using a PDF reader. And 40 if you're looking at the page number of the book itself. So inshallah, that will be our class for next week. But we will stop for now and we say wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad subhanallahi wa bihamdihi subhanaka allahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh